Degrees, which I hope will be a discussion that really focuses on both the pros and the cons of public-private partnerships, a bit of a mouthful, and how they fit into the broader context of everything that's going on in New York City and across the state. So just to start things off, I invite each of the panelists to introduce themselves and just explain briefly how they fit into the world of public-private partnerships. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm uh, Assemblymember Amy Pollan. Uh, my district is in Westchester County, Lower Westchester County. I touch the Bronx. So I, I represent uh, primarily communities that are uh, very affluent, uh, Scarsdale, Bronxville, Pella Manor, but I do have in the mix two cities, uh, White Plains and New Rochelle, which, um, uh, you know, has a, has, have diversity, have poor people, and uh, so I really have um, a district that I think reflects a lot of um, differences uh, in terms of their approach. My portfolio as a state assembly member is corporations and public authorities. So I oversee, uh, and this is really where uh, there's some overlap in terms of this issue, I oversee uh, the Port Authority, for example, uh, so projects such as the, the takeover privatization of Stewart Airport and the bringing that back to the public arena uh, would fall in there. You know, the recent LaGuardia uh, renovations was a public-private partnership. Uh, as well as uh, the MTA, which, uh, as we know, uh, has many uh, financial uh, problems right now, as well as other issues um, related to uh, the renovation of the uh, subways and uh, fast forward, as well as the Metro North and uh, Long Island Railroad. So that's, you know, all the authorities uh, do some kind of a look at public-private partnership, but there are very many. I just highlighted a couple. Uh, good morning, everyone, and Zach, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Darren Block. I'm a senior advisor to the mayor and a director of the mayor's office of strategic partnerships. Uh, I think there's a bio that's, that's around, but just to give a context in this conversation, <clears throat> I spent about 20 years working in and around city and state government. Uh, spent four years as a uh, uh, with Empire State Development as a VP for Public Affairs, and then as an EVP there for the last uh, worked for the New York City Council, worked for the Public Advocates Office. Uh, for the last five years, I've been working in this administration uh, here in the city um, uh, for four years as the Executive Director of the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, which is one of uh, a constellation of city affiliated nonprofits that looks to find and foster public-private partnerships with the city. And then for the last uh, four or five months or so, I've, I've been in a position as a director of the Mayor's Office of Strategic Partnerships, which is a, a new role that, uh, that this mayor created when he came into office. Um, and the idea really is uh, how the office can uh, kind of foster an approach uh, to some of the themes we've been talking about uh, today and that, that city and state and, and nonprofit media have focused on the last several years, which is the, how do we create a culture of partnership? And to a point I think Julie Greenberg made, um, you know, we, we talk about how government cannot do this work alone. And how do you create the, um, you know, sort of a, a game plan and an environment in which government, which is not easy to work with, uh, can be a little bit more receptive to those who want to work with government um, and how even within government we can create a culture that understands the power of partnership and that uh, while it's easier um, and maybe sometimes faster to go alone, you can usually go further and better when you, uh, go, with, when you go with others. Uh, so that's been a, a focus of my approach uh, with, uh, with this administration. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Council Member Ben Kalos, uh, you may also know me as at Ben Kalos on every social media channel. Uh, I feel honored to be here with Zach Williams. Uh, Darren Block, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I believe he created the first read. Uh, and it's, I, I'm in it today, uh, but uh, overall it's just something every time I see it, I, I think of the great work he did. and I think it's something that really puts city and state on the map, and of course as Assembly Member Amy Fallon has been a uh, leader on animal rights and women's rights and human trafficking. We're just so I'm I I'm kind of forgive me for being a little bit of a fanboy here, but just very excited to be on this panel. And then the audience, 
Thank you for braving the storm out there. It is, it is really coming down. And so I just, uh, in terms of the public-private partnerships, I really appreciate that city and state is really calling attention to it because for me, my feeling is that government is pretty broken and that the best way we can get things done is to be honest about how broken government is. And part of the reason it's broken is because it's a democracy. And in order for it to be a democracy, it needs people. And most time, people aren't involved. Uh, they just want to be left alone, as it were. And so a lot of it has been about how do we build public-private partnerships to get more people involved in our democracy. And just we've been able to build a lot of those partnerships with our parks. Uh, building out a conservancy in every single park and working with major institutions along the east side to invest in the local parks. Uh, working with real estate developers to build schools in the district. Uh, transportation, uh, working with folks like City Bike to give us a bike infrastructure at no cost to the city. Uh, the, these are all things where we've been able to do it. Working with religious institutions and nonprofits to really support our city on homeless outreach and services. Uh, I chair the Committee on Planning Dispositions and Concessions, uh, with, where if you are interested in building affordable housing, the city has hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars available to partner with you to get it done. Ultimately, as a legislator, I think that we make a lot of public policy without studying it. And so we partner with universities to figure out uh, whether or not it's working for something I like to call evidence-based policy making. It's a bad word in Washington. I think it's a good word here. And we've also been able to partner with small groups and companies like Intuit uh, to build out and try to solve problems like how to get people more benefits. So <clears throat> when, when I first heard the term uh, public-private partnership, it's, it's kind of deceptively simple, isn't it? It's, you know, these are three words that are pretty easy. It almost seems like something that you intuitively would know what it means. And then I think I found once I came to city and state that I had no idea what these, the specific meanings of each of these words in that term. So really there's kind of like a, a constellation, uh, or a constellation, a spectrum of public-private partnerships where when it comes to uh, projects with the state and the city. So you got design bill, which you might have heard, also two simple words with a hyphen on one side, and then you got what's known as full P3s on the other side. Darren, you know a few things. You've dealt with some PPPs in your time. Could you just explain a little bit about what, what the spectrum includes and what it really all is getting at? Yeah, and I, and I think I think you hit on, on just the reality that we could be talking about just uh, deep uh, generational infrastructure, some sort of massive, uh, you know, regional, uh, trans transformational regional projects. And we could also be talking to the councilman's points about uh, developing a proof of concept and how do we, uh, you know, do a demonstration in a small way? How do we uh, sort of build our knowledge base, foster knowledge transfer? Um, so I think, I think it's, it's almost a turn to your point that um, can be so broad as to be meaningless at some point, because at some point, if you think about how government, city, state, and federal operates, um, I mean, I would even suggest that the type of relationships we have with our nonprofit networks, uh, you know, out in communities who are uh, executing on government contracts, first of all, uh, you know, well documented, rarely getting, you know, 100% on the dollar for their efforts, and so they are frequently having to go out and fundraise for other parts of those services. So I would say that um, even as a um, as a, an operation of government takes on a certain public private partnership. So I think I think really to the point of this kind of conference and this kind of conversation, uh, public private partnership um, to me get, gets to um, uh, the essence of it is an approach to problem solving whether it's the building of infrastructure, the delivery of social services, or the transfer of knowledge that, um, that fosters, uh, that fosters a, a system or approach um, that, that brings in others into the process to contribute to something. And so whether that something is, um, is dollars, is people power, other resources, or knowledge, that, that is to be the sort of fundamentals of all the so, Assemblywoman Pollen, tell me, where, where is the state at right? The, the state has been criticized for having kind of a sluggish pace in adopting P3s. Right now, just uh, design build is allowed for some um, agencies at the state level. 
What is your sense with the new Democratic majorities in the state legislature? Just where lawmakers are in terms of experimenting with projects in this type of way? Well, I, I hardly can speak for the whole state legislature. And certainly, uh, you know, there is a, a dramatic shift this year because of the uh, majority in the Senate now being a Democrat. Um, and 15 of them are brand new, so I don't even know what they look like. In fact, the other day confused an assembly member for a senator um, uh, because there are so many new people. So I'm only going to, um, you know, tell you that you know the maybe the history more so than you know what we know or will expect in this year's budget. Now, uh, I will say that the governor did put in the executive proposal. Uh, an ability to uh, have design bill for uh, many, many more uh, projects, in fact, uh, would authorize the dormitory authority essentially to uh, allow any project that came through its doors to be design bill, uh, uh, which is almost every project in New York. Uh, uh, so uh, there is going to be a proposal on the table to evaluate. There has been a real reluctance to approve uh, anything but very specific projects uh, in the state budget in the past, and that was with uh, a more conservative Senate. So I don't really see that shifting. Uh, and, and, and part of the reason is you don't know, you know, when you merely authorize something. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back in history, you know, and, uh, you know, in, in 1995 through 99, uh, I served on the Scarsdale Village Board. And, you know, so a small public-private partnership was a con the concession stand at the Scarsdale Pool. And at the time, I was the youngest member of the Scarsdale Village Board and the only one that went to the Scarsdale Village Pool. And the concession stand was horrible. It was, they were not, they were, it was, it was beyond what anybody would imagine eating at the time. Uh, but no one on the village board, except for me, went. And I would complain about it and tell them we had to revisit the contract, the private contract, or the, the, the contract with a private entity. Nobody had an interest. Uh, and the contract came up, and I held it up, and I held it up, and what did they do? They waited me out, because we have term limits in Scarsdale, and they did the contract when I was off the board. Now, the food did improve because of all the uh, public outcry that I, you know, because I said publicly um, that it was horrible. But that's just one small example, and I use that example because, you know, when you're looking at any public-private partnership, these are individual in nature. You have to be sure that it's the right fit for the right um, uh, either uh, public authority or the right fit for a government entity and there's a reluctance for legislators to give blanket approval uh, before they know those details. And council member, what, what would you say for kind of the appetite for this type of experimentation at the city level? I think that baked into the city council's land use process is almost a requirement for public-private partnership. Uh, whether the council is, is lauded for it or criticized for it, I, I have rarely ever seen a, a land use transaction where the council member did not come back with uh, benefits to the community from the city as part of the increase in, in uh, density, uh, whether it's schools or parks or investments in the community from the developers. Uh, or even tenants, and, and so I, I, I would just, I, I would say it's actually probably a more of a mandate here in the city, and to just echo uh, a little bit of what the assembly member has mentioned, within the council there becomes a little bit of criticism sometimes about the types of community benefits different council members are able to win. Uh, there's also just an, an fairly transparent, but there's also the, the specter, at least in the city, of campaign finance, and uh, whether or not the folks involved in these transactions are also giving money to elected officials at the same time as uh, they might be uh, 
being asked to give things to the community. I've found that as a person who doesn't take money from real estate developers, I've been able to get more from the from, for my community. Uh, and ultimately, I want to share that when I got elected, one of the things we did is we pulled all the contracts from all the public-private partnerships and discovered in a lot of places the contracts have been expired. Uh, sometimes you can have a, a almost a, a legacy of patronage that continues long beyond that uh, elected official being out of office and perhaps even being dead, but that patronage still carries on with the momentum. And Any examples? <laughs> there is a tennis bubble in my district that is uh, 40, that is part of a, a, it's a park that's been privatized for 40 years. Uh, it goes back, I believe, to the uh, Koch administration, and uh, it's one of those situations where, I, I, anyone here play tennis? Uh, only one or two people, but I would just say if you wanted to play tennis, if you go to a city tennis court, it's $15, sorry, it's $100 for the season. And at this location, it's $200 an hour. And so we pulled that contract and have brought attention to the fact that a city park shouldn't cost $200 an hour to use. It's the most expensive tennis court in the city. So uh, I would say we, we have a lot of great examples. That one would be a, an example where no one was paying attention and it kept getting renewed year in, year out. Council members got weeded out. I got lucky that it was happening while I was there and I knew enough to pull the contracts. But to, to your question about, about the appetite at a state or city level, I, what I've found is the appetite to find public-private is great because everybody is, is, um, is very aware of the limited resources they had to work with to do an unlimited amount of good. So, so the appetite is great, but I think what the Assemblywoman touches on and I think what the Councilman uh, hits on is the, the tension there is government is very risk-averse which simultaneously leads to public-private partnership because you want to do proof of concept with dollars that, that you can try something and let it fail because the, the one, I mean, one of the, my largest critiques and frustrations with those who observe government is if a program or a project fails, that there is, there is no, there's actually zero room for failure. It's, it's if something doesn't achieve every single thing it does, um, it, it's the, the individuals, the administration, states, uh, state, federal, otherwise, are, are really sort of um, sort of castigated for that. Versus in every other environment, innovation is expected to have some measure of failure. So I bring up only to say, government is risk averse, which leads to to folks seeking some kind of public private to try something. But also to the points raised, I think it also highlights that the change to something is also hard to do and and the the risk of what are we getting into in terms of a contract in terms of uh, breaking the status quo that creates the tension so it's it's a, it's a it's an interesting space with lots of i think sort of bedeviling details around tension points around transparency and and patronage around all, all the type of things but it's something that i feel like everyone has an appetite to find even if there are these sort of starts and stops and how to <coughs> Yeah, I would also, though, add, you know, government has diverse interests, aside from uh, being risk-adverse. You know, there's a, a desire to have a cheaper tennis court. Uh, you know, there's a, um, uh, and when you talk about design bill, you know, there's also a desire to make sure people are paid um, uh, well. And, of course, we have labor. Uh, issues when we uh, talk about design build. So we have multiple interests. We also have the interest in making sure that something stays in perpetuity for the public, evidenced again by the tennis court. So, so you have to weigh all those things when you're looking at a project. You know, Stewart is a really good example of something that didn't work. Uh, you know, there, and Westchester, my home county, was thinking of doing the exact same thing very recently in privatizing the airport. Uh, why didn't Stewart work? Well, it needed so much infrastructure money, and the privatization created, uh, and then there was a recession during the time when Stewart was privatized. So the developer, or the owner, had no desire to invest any money uh, in, in one of the largest, uh, people don't know this, but Stewart is almost as large as Newark, and it's so underutilized, very cheap, by the way. I just did a site visit. If you have an interest in going to Ireland, you should really look out and go through that airport. Very inexpensive, and there's a bus that comes from the city. But um, uh, it, was, 
it wasn't really, it's not, it's only now getting built up um, because of the take back, you know, uh, back to the public. So there's a lot of interests that have to be weighed when you do one of these things. So before we really descend into the breast tax, I wanted us to kind of go up and take like the 30,000 foot view here. Um, and I'll throw this out to anyone that wants to, to answer. You know, the government, government, both at local, state, federal level, has done big things in the past. Uh, built highways, built huge buildings, built airports. You know, why, why can't it still do this? People still pay taxes, they can take out bonds. Why, why do we really need these public-private partnerships more than ever? Money. <laughs> I'll buy it. Yeah, right. I mean, you, 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 we don't, um, uh, we're, we're faced with, um, uh, people are overtaxed, they feel in New York, and uh, it's very difficult, you know, especially outside of the city, uh, we have a tax cap. So to, to do anything, uh, you um, have a huge problem because there's a benefit for a community to its residents if they don't breach the, or go beyond the tax cap. There's actually an economic penalty that residents would suffer. So how do you uh, bond uh, if you were uh, under that kind of um, cloud? It's impossible. I, I, I love your question because it makes me think so back to my college days at SUNY Albany and my rhetoric class where we discussed the, how to convince people to things and I think ultimately it's about convincing folks that what you want is actually in their best interest and the community's interest. Uh, left alone as a right development will put up as many multi-million dollar condos as possible on the Upper East Side. Uh, that is what the market does. I was able to go to uh, Gary Barnett at Extel and I said, we don't have enough school seats. Your buyers are going to see press when they look at your property and say, I, I want pre-K seats and we, we have a partnership with the mayor to build more pre-K seats, but we didn't have anywhere to put it. And Gary quite wisely said, you know, I see that there is a need for school seats. And I have a, a first floor retail that we could make a lot of money on, but we also need these school seats. And, and to his credit, and, and as a preservationist, there's, there's a lot of controversy around his work. Uh, but what I will say is just, he's, he's been a real match. He's been great. We've been able to open, I believe, 180 pre-K seats. And we're working with him to hopefully open more. And I, I think at the end of the day, and I think folks can be surprised about how large a role local elected officials, assembly member senators, can play in land use and private par private public partnerships, P3s, but I think it's a matter of sitting down with folks and saying, hey, this area needs a, a seven extension in order to be viable and bringing them into it because yes, it may cost hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars, but if everyone chips in, we can activate a whole new part of the city and build a Hudson Yards, which is <coughs> like I've never, like it's something out of this world and, and what have you. And, and we've been able to build it uh, with people getting paid a good living wage and benefits and retirements. And I think that's an example. Yeah, and, and what I'd say, I'm, I'm a little bit of two minds on, on the point because on one hand, my, my role is to be an ambassador for public private. On the other hand, I feel that there's a real tension, I think this goes to the underlying point of your question. Um, Government, government is ultimately the pooled funder we all work with to advance interesting, big, public-facing social projects, right? Um, and so I actually, I sometimes feel a tension between letting government off the hook for investments that it should be making in parks or buildings or affordable housing or other types of infrastructure that are the core purpose of government sort of coming together and collecting our dollars and us all sort of raising our hand once a year, once every two years, once every four years to elect our representatives to effectuate the set power policy goals. On the other hand, and to the underlying point of some of this conversation, there aren't enough resources to go around. And I would suggest in any line of work, 
we gain value from bringing others into the process to bring a different perspective on how to accomplish something, subject matter experts that are, are advancing ideas that might not reside within government. And so of the two minds, at one hand, I think sometimes we let government off the hook for doing its core job, but on the other hand, it allows us to extend and maximize resources, dollars, opportunities that I think it's, it's hard, to, to a point made in the earlier panel, it's hard to leave money on the table when, when there are those who want to invest in our cities, in our communities, in our state. So I think we, we're obliged to pursue it even if there's so as the proselytizer of public-private partnerships, could you know are they good for for just any type of project? You know what are what are some good examples of where P3s really um, make things happen, and what are some bad examples of yeah. P3s in action? No, totally. So so I would say, and, and a lot of our work, uh, my work has tended to focus more on the kind of social service, sort of innovation and thinking side, less on the kind of deep infrastructure side, at least in the last five years. But I'd say it, it translates through. Um, what, I, what I bring up as positive for public-private is where we're trying to, um, let me see how I can say this somewhat diplomatically. Go, go, government's natural posture at every level is to work in a state of crisis. It is just the reality of many agencies. The goal is obviously to be big strategic thinkers, think about where we're going in generational thinking, but day-to-day, month-to-month, you're dealing with, with deeply troubling social issues that we're trying to help populations on, you know, on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And I bring it up, I want to say, I think public-private offers an opportunity to give um, administrators and agency heads at, at every level a lens onto a different way to do something that might be more efficient, more effective. And so I think if you're, if you're, trying, to, if you're trying to advance an innovative approach, I think public-private is great. I think if you're, if you're trying to, um, uh, if you're trying to build a well of knowledge, I think public-private is terrific. So to the point raised by the councilman, we have historically not worked in governments that, that advance sort of database thinking, evidence-based approaches to what's going on. Again, to the point of government working as fast as it can to do good for as many as possible, we tend to measure outputs but not outcomes. And so I think, so I think public-private investing in some measures that can give elected officials more data to make their decisions on, I think, is powerful, and more administrators to, to make decisions on is powerful. And then I think, um, and then I think um, public-private is great. Um, public-private is not good for ongoing needs, and so what we tend to, to focus on is if there's, if you need to build a system, if you need to find a SWAT team, if you need to, to, um, uh, to create um, uh, a model that can then be picked up by government or someone else and, and to run with it, those tend to be what public private is good for rather than something more ongoing. I think the only the only caveat I'd put on that in, in more of the infrastructure space is when the arrangement to the point of a, a typical kind of entity contracting with a vendor to share in the revenue and that's and there's, so there's incentives for that vendor. I think those are sort of ongoing relationships that try to create a win-win for both ends of it. I think that's where a more ongoing relationship can now, you mentioned innovation. Uh, preparing for this panel, I <clears throat> read something that actually came up pretty recently at the federal level. Um, Senator Elizabeth Warren had this idea to basically set up a federal drug company that would be then contracted to a real drug company to like manufacture generic drugs. Um, certainly seems like a fresh take on P3s, whether or not it would work. Um, could, could you elaborate a little bit more on you know, an example of innovation? That was achieved through a P3 in a specific project. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so we're we're right now we're we launched about three years ago a project called Connections to Care, which was uh, trying to advance a new approach to community-based mental health. The idea being that uh, we have this it's an amazing network of of um, community-based organizations doing um, uh, workforce training, working with disconnected youth, working in youth youth child care settings. And so they're coming into contact with our population, high need populations. And so the idea was, what would it look like if we embedded mental health services at locations where needy populations were already gravitating? The idea being one in four of all of us are dealing with a mental health behavioral wellness issue at any given time. This is something that's obviously peaks and flows. We're all dealing with mental health at any given time. And so the idea was, how do you rethink what community-based mental health services would look like through this type of model? So we raised um, $30 million, $10 million from the feds um, 
uh, $20 million here locally to advance that model, build evidence over five years for this type of approach for mental health services. So that's an example of trying to sort of find innovation in a healthcare setting through public private. And just to add to that, I think the problem I've been trying to solve as an elected official is, I, as Darren was mentioning, I see that government does often operate in a crisis. The best way to get something done is when something bad happens, the media is covering it, and all of a sudden your legislation that's been stalled for several years flies like you wouldn't believe, and I don't think that's a way to govern. I also don't think that the government's relationship with people should be reactive either of people having to reach out, especially in this day and age when Google knows everything about me and if my wife buy, looks at a red dress on the internet, I see that red dress for the next week. And so that's just how much information Google has, but the government has more information, especially from your tax returns, which is why I would love to just say, you file your taxes and then you get your benefits automatically. If you need uh, food assistance, you get it. If you need rent assistance, you get it. But whatever it is, instead of you having to find the 40 to 100 something different programs, they're just there. Uh, there's a small company called Intuit. They have another company that they own called TurboTax. They do taxes for two, uh, 100 million Americans. Uh, again, small company. And they had a product called Benefit Assist that they launched, which said that they were going to screen everyone using TurboTax for benefits. So I picked up the phone. I called their CEO. And I was like, can I have that software? And they were like, this is multi-million dollar software, we're operating at enterprise scale, you really think we're going to give it to you? And I was like, yeah. And so one or two years later, they actually said, we're interested. We're interested in sharing this because the CEO had personal experience in this area and wants to do well. So we worked with the uh, White House and we gave it to the Health and Human Services Administration. You can go look at that code right now and, and use it. And, and I'll just tell you as a software developer, it, it, I've seen the Grand Canyon, that code made me cry, it was so elegant. Uh, but we also went further and we partnered with HHS, they made a grant available for $5 million to study whether or not giving people benefits automatically actually had a positive impact on their long-term health outcomes. Maybe giving people benefits doesn't help, who knows, you have to study it. And so New York Presbyterian took that $5 million grant and they're studying it right now in New York City. And I passed legislation last term and we're currently working on a study coming out in the next couple of months with the city and working with all these different partners on how we can really solve the issue of hunger, of child care, of all these benefits that the city has. Because in my district on the east side, more seniors than anywhere else in the city don't get the food assistance that they deserve. It's 91% of the seniors who are, who are going hungry don't get their food assistance in my district. It is higher than anywhere else in the city, and we need to solve that to the wealthiest city in the world. So, the, um, you know, we've been doing uh, public-private partnerships, you know, on a scale, as was pointed out beginning by Zach, uh, forever. So, the most common example is, you know, the law departments of any municipality. They have lawyers that do certain things. You know, in the county, in the city, uh, they represent uh, uh, child abuse cases, child support, those kinds of things when they go to court. Those are in-house lawyers for the most part. But when they um, want to, when they get sued or want to sue in an area of expertise, it makes no sense to bring in uh, a law firm that would have an expertise, you know, for example, I'm working on the SALT litigation, you know, at the state level. Uh, and, you know, we want the best tax lawyers uh, to represent us. You know, um, Proskauer, Baker and McKenzie, you know, those are the lawyers that we reached out to and are representing us, Clary Gottlieb. You know, we didn't want to hire one person. Uh, we needed a think tank. We needed to have an assortment. And, that, and that's a, you know, a very good example. So when you say innovation, I would say we've been using that example you know, forever. Uh, you know, a, you know, what we're talking about today seems to be much more uh, infrastructure. Roads, bridges, uh, you know, for example, the Tap and Z. That's, that's an example of using design build. Uh, it expedited uh, the, the project. Um, but what really expedited the project was um, government's will uh, 
the governor's desire to get that done under his watch. So it was both, um, both a, a government push as well as using a process that would help. Uh, so it's, it's, it's always been used. Uh, the question now is, do we also use it for financing? You know, to me, that's the, that's the question today. It's easy because we've always used it. We've always used it for expertise, and I think, you know, um, uh, to Darren's point, you know, you know there's, there's um, you want to use it when you, uh, you know, on almost one-shot basis, you know, when government is going to be the center of the, um, of the activity going forward, you want to use it. Uh, because you don't want to have to, again, hire, for example, the law firms. But, but uh, the question is, do we also use it for financing? And I would just take a step back. You know, the people who want to see government use uh, this model the most have the least faith in government, right? So they have the least faith in government, so they want to see uh, businesses uh, do the financing and do everything else. Well, if you have the least faith in government, do you have enough faith in government that they're going to develop a contract and not get completely ripped off by a much more sophisticated um, uh, developer or a much more sophisticated uh, business? So <clears throat> you have to think about that as well. You know, example again, Stewart Airport. We made a bad decision to privatize that airport. I would argue that if Westchester went forward, they would be making a bad decision to privatize that airport. Uh, but, uh, you know, because we lack the sophistication to be able to develop the contract and have that forward think, and we need to keep our airports uh, as viable and up to speed as possible. So, for the public's interest. So, it's, it's, there's always going to be that weighing um, and you know we want to be sure that we have good people making those decisions uh, and that they have the expertise not to rip off uh, the public. So you raise a, a really interesting point which is <clears throat> you know the, the whole point of a public-private partnership is to involve private uh, you know the private sector right but of course not all P3s are created equal, as we've mentioned before. You got design build, where essentially you have two contract or two contractors, one doing design, one doing building. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, let's see if I can say it all quick enough. You have you know design, build, finance, operate. Uh, how how do we best assess the extent to which a public-private partnership should uh, involve the private sector? I mean. I <coughs> At least from from my end on that, it's the private sector just did what one is in the in the design build infrastructure building realm. I think the part of the premise and, and our colleagues from EDC, our colleagues from sort of Port Authority, I think um, uh, really uh, put a put a, a, a spotlight on the reality that those are partnerships that you enter into because one, they help smooth out the financing of it. Two, they bring some subject matter expertise in. Uh, from the field, um, and and they create a more efficient model for uh, you know, for what you're advancing. And so I think I think the almost everybody who looks at that I, I think would say if you can pursue any kind of building project through that lens, you can you can reduce your costs, you can have it done um, in a uh, in a faster way, and you can bring in other eyes to observe uh, uh, how how to get it done. That's that's terrific. That's optimal. I think it goes back to the fact that the Port Authority or the MTA or, any, or EDC or any of these other, DDC or school construction, they're the, the, the dollars with which they have to do an amazing amount of projects is limited. So, so we're all searching for that answer of how you can do something better, cheaper, faster uh, to get it done. So I think, I think the approach, we should always invite the private sector in to offer suggestions on how to do some of this. And I just want to, to key off of, of, of some of the assemblyman, uh, assemblywoman noted, Innovation, I think frequently, uh, Ben and I are sort of like to geek out on some stuff around, uh, around tech and around, uh, around stuff in this space. Innovation doesn't need to be the bright, shiny object. Innovation might just be someone bringing their platform into a different approach. Innovation might just be you know, taking you know, experts who are doing that here and just bringing them in to help in a different way. So uh, anyway, I'll bring, I'll bring both those up and say, I think you bring in the private sector where uh, they can help advance 
your shared goals and do it in a way where you can maximize transparency and, and alleviate the, the public concerns I think is something we've brought up before. Councilman, actually I had to, the next question for you um, on this question is, you know, how do we avoid overly privatizing the, you know, government programs? You heard I was a union side labor lawyer. <laughs> uh, so, so I, the city charter has a requirement that anytime we're looking at any type of privatization of a city service that they're supposed to compare the cost of doing it privately versus doing it with city employees and a lot of the items where I've gone to tech companies like Intuit or even I'm a free and open source software developer, other free and open source software developers, was often just to show people, look, what you're trying to pay a vendor millions or billions for, I built in eight hours or this other company, Intuit, is willing to give us for free, maybe we shouldn't do that and I guess one piece is just looking into the audience, there's gonna be like 34 open seats in the city council in 2021. And uh, I think I'm one of the few folks with a background in business and finance and running a company. It would be great to have more folks in government uh, on, on this side of the panel, as it were, who can read a balance sheet and uh, do a cash flow analysis and, and what have you. And what I will say is just overall, and, and I, I think just going back to the uh, example that the assembly member gave of the, the food stand or what have you, just trying to have a lot more transparency around the uh, contracting process. We have a lot of sophisticated constituents uh, in our mutual districts and throughout our city. We're, I think it's the smartest city in the world. You can quote me on that. And the more we can put out publicly in the contracting process, not in a way that shuts it down our ability to contract, but to just bring people in as the RFPs are being issued, whether or not those RFPs are written to benefit an incumbent or whether it's being written fairly, uh, whether or not the contract is being properly awarded. Uh, at the MTA, Michael Harad Nishanu came into the Second Avenue subway project, you can read about it in the Times, and he saw like there were a thousand people working there that he didn't know what he did, they did. So he fired all of them. And so we shouldn't be in that situation where we, where the public doesn't know about it, and I just, I, I haven't had a chance to thank city and state because uh, this paper is one of those that is finding places where things are broken, uncovering it, and leading to big uh, changes. Uh, anyone here, how many of you live in New York City? And how many of you live in a building taller than six stories? Okay, you have a water tank. Uh, I introduced legislation based on city and state's uh, reporting on that, so I think it's just, Public scrutiny is very important in order to get the best possible deal. And, and I'll say just, I spend a lot of time fighting, uh, and, and I love Darren, but fighting with other folks in the administration, just trying to get to a place where I can open the books, see exactly how much we're paying for each unit of affordable housing, so I then can negotiate it, which is actually their nightmare. They do not want, <laughs> they don't want us being able to argue the dollars and cents on each project, but I think it's important and necessary. So we're reaching the final stretch of our discussion. If you do have any questions for the panelists, uh, just fill in those pieces of paper in the middle of your table and hold up your hand and someone hopefully will be around and uh, uh, we'll bring it up to the table. <clears throat> so as people are writing down their super questions, I would like to ask, you know, how do you, what are the issues of public, how, does, how do public relations tie into public-private partnerships, especially in an age when Amazon um, has been getting a lot of press, that's not a public-private partnership per se, but it certainly increases public suspicions of, private, uh, of, of how the private sector is controlling the public sector. You know, how, how do we sell people, the public, on P3s? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, and even to the to the point raised before, I mean, I think all, all of this, to your question about, uh, you know, can you go too far on private time? Private time I think all, all of this is, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act, um, but I think the, I think the question on whether it's a, a land use deal with a community-based agreement, uh, a community benefit agreement, the role of government is to enforce that. It's to make sure that that's, that's those type of agreements, whether it's Amazon, whether it's a conventional uh, uh, community benefit agreement, whether it's some other public-private partnership, whether it's a normal contract, uh, government's role is to oversee, enforce, and make sure the terms of that are being being driven. But, but what I'd say is, it's um, 
it, it's also incumbent upon government to be uh, open and receptive to the deep well of civic goodwill that exists um, for this city, for New Yorkers, uh, in New York City, New York State, and and that is, it is uh, palpable and it is powerful because the um, the amount. I mean, what what makes my job interesting is not um, uh, the amount of times I go out and say, you know, we're really trying to figure out, you know, how to help, you know, solve a, a problem with NYCHA or with homelessness or with disconnected youth or uh, kids aging out of foster care. You know, name your name your challenge. It's how many calls I get incoming from Warby Parker saying we want to donate millions of dollars of glasses if you can figure out how to connect to the 200,000 kids in the New York City school system that are failing their eye screening and not getting glasses. Or, you know, uh, you know Fred Wilson and Union Square Ventures say, hey, we know computer science is really impressive. Can, you know, we help raise half of an $80 million idea to bring computer science everywhere? So I think, I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to be receptive to that while also not sort of ceding the reins to what is ultimately their responsibility as legislators to oversee that work and, and our responsibility on, on our administration side to, to help bring all, all, all comers to the table. Yeah, I was, <coughs> uh, I think that, you know, another word for that is transparency. You know, the, uh, the idea that, uh, you know, as a, I mean, this is a long time ago because I've been doing this for 18 years, and prior to that, I was four years on my village board. So prior to that, you know, I was uh, an advocate, like probably many of you, uh, very active in my community, uh, very active in my county, uh, and you know, I had ideas, and so did every other advocate that was sitting on the sidelines, and. You know, we, uh, we represented organizations, we represented other people that had um, expertise, and by letting the public in, uh, the, 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 the governments benefit from that. So it's, it's more cumbersome, and yes, are you going to get some ideas that are a little wacky? Um, yeah, um, but you're also going to get uh, very, very good criticisms that you should consider. Uh, maybe reject, maybe accept, but that you should consider. So it delays it sometimes, but there's so many people in my business that um, worry about that transparency, and I can tell you that it only uh, helps move things forward in a positive way. So, so I would just uh, share that I think in addition to transparency, it's just honesty. And so we have public-private partnerships. The folks who I have developers approach me and say, I like that park over there. I'd like to put up a very tall building. They're taller than any other building in Manhattan. That park is perfect for it. And often I'll say, I, I honestly think that's a horrible idea. Feel free to move forward with it, but just know I, I will likely oppose it. And uh, that's, that's life. Um, and sometimes the deal, there's just no way anyone's going to take that deal. Uh, and, and so I've said no to quite a few of those. Other times uh, we have deals that are just good, like somebody's building and they say, I think we need more school seats, I'll give you more school seats and everybody's happy. We had one issue with a part of my district on 82nd Street. There is a school that's been there for 100 years before the FDR. When they lost the FDR, they built a overhang over the Esplanade and it's literally falling down on people. It has pieces of brick uh, falling on people, it has netting, it has pigeon poop, it has water dripping, I hate it. Everybody else does too. And so I pulled the contract, saw it was expired, and I went to the city and said, can we take it down? And they were like, that costs money, we're not spending money taking down infrastructure. So the status quo was, leave it there. And so the lease had expired, so the question was, the status quo would be, lock the door, leave it there until it falls on somebody, and that's the status quo. So we went back to the school in question and said, will you fix it? And they said, we're open to it. And then I said, also, just no. And, and we went with a community group, we did a survey, and most of the people agreed with me. They just wanted it gone. And so I said, listen, everyone's going to just want this gone, but if you want access to this and you're willing to improve it, I'm willing to walk with you through this difficult task, have a public process where folks will tell you why they want you gone, but ultimately, I think we will get to a positive effect. And ultimately, we had a, a rough public hearing. But ultimately, the community said, 
if the status quo is leave it there as is, or have it improved and let the kids continue to use it, that, that's what won out, and then people started <coughs> arguing about what color it should be. So when it rains, it pours with questions, <coughs> and apologize if we can't get to everyone's, but I think this one question um, covers somewhere around this issue of how the city can take advantage for, of public-private partnerships to uh, achieve big things, whether it's the MTA, NYCHA, um, we'll, we'll spare the panelists the question about uh, whether Andrew Cuomo controls the MTA for a different day. Yes. Uh, congestion pricing. Well, we got one vote there, but congestion um, pricing. Um, you probably have heard about this idea to uh, implement uh, charges for drivers entering the central business district in Manhattan below 60th Street. And a part of that uh, that I think the question is getting at is kind of these checkpoints. Um, you know, what is the potential for public-private partnerships in something like congestion pricing? What does it mean for the city at large? I think I'm uh, having served on the MTA work group and, uh, and having to deal with that as part of my committee assignment and upcoming budget. Uh, uh, I can tell you that we're not up to that yet. <laughs> um, uh, the, there will, of course, be some public-private partnership if we go ahead with congestion pricing, uh, which I am supportive of. The uh, proposal that the governor has offered in his executive budget places uh, uh, the, the barrier uh, at 60th Street going down to the tip right here. And uh, it, would, it would eliminate, uh, there would be no tolling on the FDR, for example. There would be tolling on the west side because of all the traffic lights. It's hard to just, you know, uh, there's too many ins and outs, as, as they uh, explained it to us. But it's a proposal. And to build the infrastructure, currently in the governor's budget, there's um, the proposal is for um, a, a, an entity that the state would control. The city is greatly opposed to that. Um, feeling that it's their streets, the infrastructure should be built by them. But regardless of who has control over that, whether it's joint control, city control, state control, which again, nothing, this is only present, this is, we're only at the point where it's been introduced, there's been no dialogue among the three entities that will decide, said the state governor. Um, but uh, we're going to have to contract to build that infrastructure. It's not that the city would have. Uh, uh, workers necessarily that could put that up. You know, this is a, a kind of new infrastructure. We would have to buy the infrastructure. We'd have to put up the infrastructure. Uh, we then have to create perhaps an entity to monitor the infrastructure. So whether those are contracted out, uh, whether those are um, state workers or city workers or some combination uh, is yet to be decided. But there will be some elements that make a lot of sense to go public and a lot to go private. Uh, if, if I can jump into, I stand with my assembly member here in supporting congestion pricing. I also have concerns because London did it. I've been there, it's one of my favorite cities after New York City, but there's still congestion. And when I've spoken to a lot of the folks there, they've said it raised money, but that's about it. It hasn't deferred anyone from coming in. I am concerned about implementing it day one, and then having a rush of people on a broken subway system in London, you can't get around by car, you get on the tube. No matter what, you're on the tube. And so Dick Ravitch had proposed that we uh, create a lockbox through the financing mechanisms uh, in order to stop elected officials from stealing the money or using it for uh, other vanity items that are aesthetic and great but aren't going to actually improve it. And ultimately, I, I'm concerned about a border at 60th Street. It would split my district in half. And, uh, well, sorry, it would split a quarter of my district off. But I guess the issue is just when you try to drive around New York City, it's not a 60th Street problem. I have traffic up in the 90s. Uh, there's traffic in Queens. There's traffic in Brooklyn. There's traffic in the Bronx. There's traffic in Westchester. And so when I look at it, my thought is just if we could do a border around the city as a whole and use some of that funding for upland improvements in Westchester and what have you to eliminate the congestion in Westchester and Nassau, Queens, and just 
all the folks because there's this DOT screen line report if you're ever really interested in geeking out on this. And there's 2.5 million vehicles entering the city every single day. And a lot of those folks are driving through Westchester and, and, the, and, and other boroughs and we just need to, if, it's, if we're going to do it, I would really like to see the vehicles coming off the road with an infrastructure prepared to take a quarter of a million drivers every day. So we're running out of time, but before we let all of you uh, eat the lunch that's uh, being set out there, I would like each of our panelists to just provide uh, all of you one key takeaway for how they can make the case for P3s moving forward. Who wants to start first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would just go back to a very, uh, a broad civic concept that um, success of our cities is a shared responsibility and that um, to the notion that government can't do it alone, private sector, philanthropy, high net worth individuals, community groups, all need to be part of that success and feel a sense of shared responsibility. And to me, that's, that's the, the foundation upon which pu public private partnership can be built. I'm going to assume that my uh, friend and colleague Darren has convinced you and just make a, a pitch and a call to action to please consider partnering uh, with me or with Darren uh, with an idea you have to make our city a better place. Uh, and, I, yeah? I would, um, I, would, uh, I would say that there is absolutely a role, as there has always been, for public-private partnerships, and we should constantly be looking to, um, to that model uh, to gain the best expertise we have as a community uh, to go forward. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, to be cautious in relinquishing uh, what should be a, a government responsibility. So we, we have to strike that balance. Uh, but having said that, you know, there has always been a role, there will continue to be a role, and we need to think about innovation, and we need to think about limitations of government, financing, and so forth, uh, in order to make the community the best it can be. And I think we'll have to leave the panel at that. Uh, for those of you who didn't have your questions answered, hang in there. I think a lot of these will be covered by the panel um, later, in the, later today. So with that, let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists. Great. Thank you again, Zach. Thanks to the panel. Uh, that concludes our morning session. There is lunch.